Okay, thank you, Paddy. Maybe we'll start with the prayer. Uh, forgive me using the iPad, but my mother's printer was broken at home, so I've got my material on this. So maybe we'll start with the prayer. Uh, this is a prayer from the encyclical Lumen Fide, uh, The Light of Faith, that was written by Pope Benedict and published by Pope Francis. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And it's a prayer to Our Lady, asking her to increase our faith. Mother, help our faith. Open our eye, our ears to hear God's word and to recognize his voice and his call. Awaken in us a desire to follow in his footsteps, to go forth from our own land and to receive his promise. Help us to be touched by his love, that we may touch him in faith. Help us to entrust ourselves fully to him and to believe in his love, especially at times of trial beneath the shadow of the cross, when our faith is called to mature. So in our faith, the joy of the risen one. Remind us that those who believe are never alone. Teach us to see all things with the eyes of Jesus that he may be the light for our path. And may this light of faith always increase in us until the dawn of that undying day, which is Christ himself, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So very good. So I'm going to look at a couple of things in this talk. Um, I hope it's coherent um, and that I don't kind of go all over the place with it. But what I'd like to do is, if we need to look at how to increase our faith, I'd say the first thing we need to do is to see together what is faith. What is it that we need to increase? Because unfortunately, there can be a lot of confusion with the word faith. I mean, the church has got all sorts of nice words, and theology has all sorts of lovely words, and we think we know what they mean. But many times, I mean one thing and you mean another, and the church might mean something else. So it's good to kind of get our, our, um, our foundations in common to look at something like this. And so to look at what faith is, first of all, I would recommend, especially uh, for homework, for those who want to do a little bit of homework afterwards, to take a look at the, uh, the encyclical. It's the first encyclical, technically, of Pope Francis, Lumen Fide, the light of faith, the one that the prayer came from. And it's... Um, it's an encyclical that actually Pope Benedict had finished. It was finished on the desk, and he hadn't had a chance to publish it before he retired. And rather than signing it after he'd announced his resignation, and before he'd resigned, before he'd retired, he left it on the desk, finished, and within the first week of becoming Pope, Pope Francis promulgated it. So it's, a, it's an encyclical technically by Pope Francis, but it really is by Pope Benedict lightly edited or very lightly touched by, by Pope Francis and then promulgated or published by him. So it is um, a, a, it's like a small book on what faith is and, how, and, and its role in today's world. The other place always to look, I always have these two books in front of me, that they're always the, the best way to find out about anything in the faith is obviously the scripture. The Bible is uh, one place to go. And the other one is this uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is a great enlightenment of our faith, and it has it explained for us. So when talking about faith, where do we begin? I would say we need to begin at seeing exactly what faith is. And for this, I want to read a, a reading from, if you forgive me for changing glasses, but I've come to that point in life where I can kind of see one with one uh, close-up stuff with this and far away stuff with that pair. So anyway, so I want to read this um, reading, and forgive me, it's a, it's a full chapter, but it's a reading from the Epistle to the Hebrews. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the conviction of realities that are unseen. For this, our ancestors were attested. By faith, we understand that the ages were created by a word from God, so that from the invisible, the visible world came to be. In faith, Abel offered God 
a better sacrifice than Cain. And for this he was approved as righteous when God himself approved his gifts. He is dead, but by his faith he still speaks. Through faith Enoch was taken up, so that he did not experience death. He was no more because God had taken him up. Before he was taken up, he was attested as having pleased God. Now without faith, it is impossible to please God, since anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and rewards those who seek him. In faith, Noah, when he had been alerted by God to something that had never been seen before, foresightedly built an ark to save his family. Through faith, he passed judgment on the world and received the heritage of righteousness according to the faith. In faith, Abraham obeyed the call to set out for a place which he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out without knowing where he was going. By faith, he sojourned in the promised land as a stranger living in the tents with Isaac and Jacob, who were his heirs, with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the well-founded city of which God was the designer and the builder. In faith, Sarah also, in spite of being barren and beyond the age of conception, was made able to receive the seed to bear a child because she believed that he who had, had the promise, made the promise, was faithful. Because of this, from one man, and him as good as dead, was born, were born descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven and the grains on the sand of sand on the seashore, which cannot be counted. In faith, all these died before receiving the promises, but seeing them from afar, welcoming them and recognizing that they were only strangers and sojourners on earth. People who say such things make it quite plain that they are seeking a homeland. If they had meant the country from which they had, came, they had come, they would have had the opportunity to return to it. But in fact, they were longing for a better homeland, a heavenly one. This is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, since he had made ready a city for them. The word of the Lord. Thank you. So that's the first half of chapter 11 of the letter to the Hebrews. Which again, uh, this is what faith is about. How do we know what faith is? And again, the scripture is the best place to go. And this, again, this is one of the definitions. If you look up different dictionaries, Catholic dictionaries, as to what faith is, and it's the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of realities that, sorry, can't get, that, that are unseen. So it, this is what faith is. That is this certainty that there is another reality. And again, this is very different to what is often meant by faith. Because I'm sure if you go to the streets, if you were to go to the streets of Cork this afternoon with a microphone and start asking people, do you have faith? I'm sure most people would say yes. And I would think most people by faith mean that they kind of believe that God exists. That I would say today, most people still kind of believe that God exists. It doesn't bother them much one way or the other. You know, it's just, it's easier to believe. You know, we've always been told that God exists and that God made the world. And sure, look, I suppose at this stage, some people believe that it's something that, that maybe uh, Dawkins or somebody else is right and that there is no God. But most people, it's just, it's simply easier to believe that God made the world and that God exists and it kind of stays there. It's gone somewhere up, up there, I'm down here, and I have to make my own life. And we live our lives as if everything depended on ourselves. That this idea that by your fists you earn your life, that you work hard, you make your life, you, you study, and that you can do whatever you want. And this is our generation especially, that we can do anything we set our minds to. You have this, uh, this thing today that you can get a book and it'll tell you how to do anything or you can find a YouTube video and as I say if your wife needs brain surgery a good YouTube video and a corkscrew and you can fix her <laughs> but this idea that we can do anything I'm sorry is simply wrong that we are not capable of doing everything 
In fact, there are many things that we cannot do. And the main thing we cannot do is that we are incapable of finding happiness for ourselves. That somebody works with all their might, does everything they can, and they can never achieve what is happiness. And we see this particularly with our successful people. The people that are in the glossy magazines, the people that are on the, uh, the, the television, the people that are in the, uh, the, on TikTok, or all the stars of the internet. So often they're miserable. You look at the people who are multi-millionaires, who have uh, made it according to our society, and so often they're the ones getting divorced, they're the ones in the middle of scandals, they're the ones who are profoundly unhappy. Because this world in and of itself is not enough. It's like uh, the, the letter of the Hebrews is saying, it's to understand that we belong to another nation, that the Christian belongs to another place, that is not simply a citizenship from here. When we die and we go to heaven, the Lord will not be asking you for an Irish passport or an Italian passport or even a passport from the Vatican won't be good enough. It is if he recognizes us as being his children, if he recognizes the attitudes of Jesus Christ in us. And so to see what faith is, it's good to look again. The basic definition from the catechism is, let me see, sorry, I hate this. Faith is a personal act, the free response of the human person to the initiative of God who reveals himself. Faith is not an isolated act. No one can believe alone, just as no one can live alone. You have not given yourself faith as you have not given yourself life. The believer has received faith from others and should hand it on to others. Our love for Jesus and for our neighbor impels us to speak to others about our faith. Each believer is thus a link in a great chain of believers. I cannot believe without being carried by the faith of others, and, my faith, and by my faith I help support others in faith. This is 166 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. As this definition of faith, that faith is this relationship. It's to be a link in this chain that is the faith of the Church. So faith is a personal adherence to the, of, the, of the whole man to God who reveals himself. It involves an assent of the intellect and the will to the self-revelation God has made through his deeds and his words. So faith, first of all, by Christian faith, we have to understand that this is a response to the action of God. So the first actor in faith is God himself. God reveals himself to us. That God created the world, but it wasn't enough to create the world, but he had to redeem the world. Because of our free will, God made us free. That this is one of the main characteristics of the human person. I mean, man is free. The human being is free. This is what distinguishes us from the animals. This is what distinguishes us from a flower. I mean, this is the difference between you and a mountain that you are free, and that we have free will that allows us to choose to do good, to choose to love God. And our life is dependent, the success of our life is dependent on how we use this free will. And so God, knowing that so often we've met, we mess up, knowing that Adam and Eve would sin, he came to save us. He came throughout history through what we refer to often as the history of salvation, that God did not abandon humanity. He did not abandon the world. He created the world, he created the world good, but he created us free. And part of our freedom, unfortunately, entailed that sometimes we mess up. Sometimes we make great choices, but all of us sometimes make terrible choices. And that in a sense, even as humanity's origin in Adam and Eve, we have what's called the original sin where Adam and Eve rejected God, rejected his love, rejected hope in him, and created misery for themselves. And God, not wanting to abandon us, not getting sick of us, not saying to us, you deserved it, I gave you an option, you didn't take it, therefore this is what you deserve. He came to rescue us. 
and this history of salvation is God's gradual work of salvation that throughout the centuries, throughout the millennia, starting before the Old Testament, he started working with humanity through many different facets, many different areas. And then especially in the Old Testament, that's what the, the epistle to the Hebrews that we, were, that we heard at the beginning was about, that God is working with all these people and he's showing them that there is a, a further reality, a different reality, a deeper reality than what we can see. And this is what faith opens up for us, that faith really is the certainty that God is love. That we live our lives and it's like every ache and pain that we have is telling us that God does not love you. So you wake up in the morning, the alarm clock goes, and it seems that you've only been sleeping for half an hour and that you've got to get up and go to work. And the first reality that's there is to say, no, God, there's been a mistake. There's been a mistake. I, should, I shouldn't have to get up now or the children awake you, or something happens, and you should say, no, that's a mistake. And then maybe you get out of bed, and you've got a pain in your back, and that's another mistake. And there's so many things in our lives that are pushing us, in a sense, to blaspheme. Maybe not verbally, but to say that this is a mistake, that things should be better, things should be good. And not to realize God's love, not to realize his providence, not to realize his care, not to realize his tenderness with us. And really, Christian faith is the conviction that God is love and that he is inviting you and me to live by this love. This is what it means to have faith. And it's not simply some sort of an academic, um, an academic uh, proposition. You know, it's not. Again, the, the creed is absolutely true. The formula that we find in the catechism, the, 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 the the lessons that you probably learned as a child uh, in preparation for your First Communion, your Confirmation. All these are absolutely true. But we don't believe in words. It's not enough to sign on the dotted line. It's not enough to say, okay, I, I agree with this. It's easier to agree with this. God created the world, okay, whatever. This a trinity, God is three in one, no problem. I, I'll buy into that. Just tell me where I sign. Uh, that Jesus rose from the dead 2,000 years ago, sure, that's fine, I'll agree with it, but it doesn't affect my pain th today. It doesn't affect the fact that I'm not getting on with my boss. It doesn't affect the fact that, uh, I don't know, my next door neighbor is having a fight with us over, the, over, over where to put the bin, and she always puts it so that it's kind of blocking my car as I go out. That this is, unfortunately, to see that faith is not just a belief, but it's something that helps us day by day. It's a conviction. To be absolutely sure. You know the things that you're absolutely sure about. Sometimes you can be sure of something and there is no way to convince you otherwise. So for example, my mother's name is Patricia. There is no way you can convince me that she's called Beatrice or Gertrude or whatever. You know, I, I mean, there's no way you can convince me of that. Absolutely, I know her name. The, you know, if you put a gun to my head and tell me, to say that her name is Beatrice. Okay, I might say her name is Beatrice, but I won't mean it. You know, there's no way that you can change this in me. There's no way you can take this conviction away from me. And this is what faith is, basically, to have the same conviction about the love of God. To say that God is love, and everything that is happening is good. Everything that is happening is well. That no matter what is happening in my life, no matter what might be a disaster, no matter what would be uh, the cross that's there, that the prayer that I read at the beginning from Pope Benedict was talking about the cross, no matter what cross is there, and as always, if you want to know your cross, you want to know what this cross is that we speak about so often in, in church, what is your cross, as opposed to just the cross of Jesus, the cross each one of us bears, is that if you find Aladdin's lamp, and the genie comes out and says, I give you three wishes. What is wish number one? The thing you change as your first wish is probably your cross. And as I say, the danger for many of us is to turn this into a criticism against God. God, if you really loved me, I would have been rich. If you really loved me, I wouldn't have the sickness. If you really loved me, my child would be doing I don't know what. And to have faith is to see that, yes, God really does love you in precisely these moments that are difficult, in these things I cannot understand. 
So this is the first thing about faith. It's not simply to say God exists. I mean, to say God exists is the absolute rudiments, the very basic beginning of faith. But it is an adhesion, an agreement with the revelation of God. So the first thing is to see that the first actor in faith is God, not us. God isn't in heaven because I believe in him. God doesn't exist. He's not a, a function of my imagination. God is not created by me. I'm created by God. We're created by God. And it's not that all of us together manage to somehow or other create a, a, a force field and have God in heaven. And if we stop believing in God, he's going to fall and his throne will come down out of heaven and fall in the Atlantic Ocean. It's not this. God is sovereign. God is God. He is almighty. He is omnipotent. And he is all loving. And part of this love is to reveal himself. So God shows himself to us. He shows himself to us, again, in many ways. First of all, through his actions. That the actions that then get codified in the Bible. That the Bible is um, like a crystallization of the action of God. That God works. Throughout history, God works. That he creates. Even in the Old Testament, the first page of the Bible, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God says, God's word creates. That he makes the world, he makes the universe. He made you, he made me. And he has all of us in his tender mercy, in his care. That each one of us is being protected by him, and he is accompanying us day by day with his love, with his blessings, with his goodness. And to have faith is to have the conviction of this, that nobody can take this away from you. That as Christians we're called basically to this, to understand that God is the author of everything and the response we give, because this response has to be free. Nobody is obliged. This is the, uh, the nature of Christianity, that God calls you to follow him. He gives you everything you need to follow him. But the one thing that God will not do is force you. St. Augustine said that God created us without our permission, but he will not save us without our permission. So God created you. You, know, you didn't sign a waiver to be created. You didn't give your permission. You didn't press the button to be created. You know, one day, your, your parents found you under a head of cabbage or whatever, and you came into this world. That you came in where, without, you know, without any say, really, of anybody, not even your parents had a say in the matter. That you know, they, didn't, they didn't mail order you, they didn't custom make you. You're the child that God created. And you were born without this permission, without giving permission. However, we cannot be saved without our permission. That God will not force us. He respects us utterly to the extent that he will not force us, which is, again, which is a great mark of respect, a great mark of love, because, you know, when, when we, I mean, if we could see the stupidities we do, and God is looking at us, and he doesn't, he doesn't force us a different direction. He lets us live our lives, inviting us always, to come back to him, inviting us always to be well, inviting us always to live by his grace, giving us the grace we need, offering us everything, but never forcing us. So faith is the response of man, of the human person to God's grace. That God invites you to happiness, God invites you to wholeness, God invites you to a life of blessedness here. Not simply to go to heaven after you die, Again, this is God's hope for every one of us. This is his plan for every one of us. But it's not simply that you live here and that more or less, and that then when you die, hopefully you go to heaven. This is not what faith is about. Faith is to live here with the light of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ enlightens your way. It's the same thing. I mean, light is a very, very easy symbol to get. <coughs> that if you're in utter darkness, it doesn't happen too much anymore because now we all have lights in our houses, there is a million machines that are giving light, there's the phone with the torch in it, but if you're in utter darkness, you don't know where you are. I don't know if you've ever um, 
had that experience of being in absolute darkness. That there's a power cut or whatever and you're there and you can't, you can't see anything. And when you're in darkness, you can't find anything. You know, that what is your bedroom, which should be maybe the room that's most familiar to you, becomes strange. That your shoes on the floor become a weapon of mass destruction as you're trying to walk and that you trip and that you know and that you bang your, your, your shin into the into the into the corner of a table. That this is what darkness does to us. This is why children sometimes are afraid of the dark. Because it's it's unknown, it's difficult. And life can be like this. Again, as adults, in a sense, I hope we're over the fear of the dark. That I hope we're over being afraid when it gets dark or having to sleep with the light on. Uh, you know, I think we're beyond that, although now more and more people are falling asleep with the telephone in their hands as they're playing on it. But still, we're, we're, we're adults, we're all over these things, yet the temptation is to be afraid. Our temptation is to be afraid of so many things. Will tomorrow be okay? Will I be able to survive? Will I have enough money to last until the end of the month? What will happen if what happens if I need, I don't know, if I need a doctor, I don't have insurance. What happens if, and this fear, this fear that's there, and this idea that then comes in that I have to do everything myself. I have to create the light. And we don't create the light. The light comes from Jesus Christ and is mediated for us in the church. This is the other thing. It's not simply, uh, it's not simply a personal encounter is one of the big differences between Catholicism and Protestantism. That in Catholicism, we know that faith is a meeting with Jesus Christ in the church. That we need other people. We need brothers and sisters. We need people around us. Again, the, 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 the idea of faith uh, that the Catechism is giving us as being a, a link in a chain. So we can never live faith by ourselves. We can never do faith, just me. I mean, that this is, this is unknown in Christianity. We need always to have a community around us. You know, even, even the, the, the religious who are hermits, even they have to be formed in a community and in a sense even spiritually attached to a community before they can perform the work of being a hermit. And the rest of us are called to have brothers and sisters. This is why, I suppose I'm, I'm going ahead of myself, but in order to get faith, one of the things we need is we need to have a faith community. We need to have somewhere where we can find faith. Be it a school, at Mahri Day Academy for the children, or be it other people of like-minded, or a prayer group, or a new kind of communal community, or a, a charismatic group, or something. Some place where we can find faith. That, in a sense, it's not enough. This is, and this is one of the things that is a pity today. The challenges that we have in the last couple of years now is that we now have a section of our, of our church that doesn't come to church anymore. And since the lockdowns, again, I'm not criticizing what happened in 2020, and that for a while people had to attend church virtually. And that, yeah, the, the internet is fine, and uh, streaming is fine, and all this is fine, as it says he as he's being recorded by this machine. All these things are fine, but they're not enough. That we need a human contact with others. That you can't be Christian by yourself. Because we need other people to help us to grow in faith. We need other people as a mirror to show us how we are, to correct us, to give us love, to give us forgiveness, to be able to forgive. I mean, you know, I mean, in the Our Father, we say, pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And if we neither see our own trespasses nor have anybody trespassing against us, we simply cannot have faith. And so this faith is something that is given. It is a gift of God. It is something that comes to us through the church by our ascent. So there's the two elements that God offers the faith, God gives us the opportunity of faith, and then we have to receive this faith mediated through the church and also by our free will. So it's mediated by the church and in our free will. That we have to agree. In a sense, we have to say amen. When you go to communion, uh, the priest says to you, the body of Christ. 
And <coughs> not just, I mean, it happens now, again, I know people are sometimes meditating so deeply that they're not quite sure what they're doing. But it's, I see it happening more and more. You go to the body of Christ, and the person goes, thank you. It's, it's not thank you, it's amen. We say amen, we say amen to God. We say, let it be. I want this to be true. It's an optative uh, verb, amen. It is to say, I want this to be real. I, want, I, I agree that this is the body of Christ. I accept that this is the body of Christ. And I want it to be true in my life. I want to become this body of Christ. I want this to, to strengthen me, to change me, to forgive me, to refashion me, to reforge me. And that I'm agreeing to this. I'm giving my consent. And so this is, this is a huge part of faith, to allow God to be God. Which is, if God is God, I'm not God. I do not have this omnipotence. I'm not, I don't know everything. I don't have better, you know, it's, it's like there's a, there's a very stupid movie that came out a few years ago. It's called Bruce Almighty. That is about this guy that is complaining, complaining, complaining and giving out to God. And eventually God appears to him. I think he's Morgan Friedman, but anyway, God appears to him and said, okay, you do it. I'm, re I'm going on holidays. I'm going on vacation. You be God for a while. And the poor guy makes a mess of everything. Having been given all the powers, he makes a mess of everything because he can't see how things fit together. And this is our problem, that we need to surrender. That we have our ideas, we have very clear ideas, but prayer cannot simply be me telling God what to do. Your relationship with God has to be different to your relationship with your butler. Again, I'm sure all of you have butlers at home, or, uh, but I mean, the way you'd have a butler, and they tell me in Iraq, well either, but uh, a butler does what you tell him. So a butler, you'll tell him, you need to get the dining room ready, I'm having a party, you need to polish my shoes, you need to do this, to do that, and you give the butler instructions. And unfortunately, our prayers are very much, and again, I speak for myself more than for you, I'm sure you're much holier than I am, but many times my prayers, I see, are treating God like a butler. You know, God doesn't know the problems I have. You know, it doesn't, does he need me to instruct him, to tell him, do this and this and this? I need you to fix this problem. My, my workmate is a disaster. You need to really help him to get his act together. This person over here, the student I'm teaching is failing, so you need to help her to study. And in a sense, many times they can be very good ideas, but prayer isn't simply me telling God what to do. There has to be more than anything an acceptance of the will of God. That God's will for us is better than we can conceive of ourselves. And faith is to trust that God is loving. Again, I, I can't stress this enough. I know I'm going back a little. God is love. The relationship that God has with us is a relationship of love, of care, of tenderness, of forgiveness. But again, in order to accept this forgiveness, first of all, we have to recognize that we need forgiveness, that we are sinners, that we have done wrong, and that this is what faith is about. So again, um, how do we get faith? So I think, more or less, what is faith? That again, what the Catechism says, but faith is this relationship with God. More than anything, it's to have a living relationship with God. And how do we have this relationship? First of all, by talking to God. You know, when you are friends with somebody, you talk to them. You know, if you don't have contact with somebody, you're not their friend. I mean, today we've debased the meaning of friendship again. We're not quite sure what friendship means anymore because with Facebook and everyone's got 10 million friends on Facebook and yet they never talk to anybody. That a friend is somebody you talk to. And our society is kind of pushing us away from talking. The last thing people do with a mobile phone nowadays is to talk on it. Mm -hmm. That they play on it, they look at uh, you know, solitaire or looking at uh, videos or whatever and never actually even talking. So to be friendly with somebody is first of all to talk to them, to have time with them, to give them time. I mean, when you were young and you were in love, probably with your fiancé you talked. That, and back in the day when phone calls cost by the minute, maybe you got into trouble for speaking too long. And this is what it means to be a friend with somebody, 
to spend time with them. You can say, I'm a great friend of John. Now, I haven't seen him in 20 years, but he's my best friend. I mean, maybe you've fallen out of contact with him, and 20 years ago he was your best friend. But if for somebody to be your friend, there needs to be contact, there needs to be time. That there needs to be this investment of time. And the first thing to have faith is to ask for faith. Again, um, the apostles, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you could say to the sycamore tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. So faith, the first way to get faith is very simple. You don't buy faith. You, can, you can't get faith on Amazon. Faith is not available. You can go to the English market and you can ask. And if the shopkeeper is there, if they can sell you faith, maybe some of them will try to sell you something or other, but they won't be able to sell you faith. You cannot buy it. You cannot earn it either. It's not a matter of my work. I cannot, in Christianity, it's a heresy called Pelagianism, to think that I can earn my own faith. That you cannot pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. On the one hand, yes, my free will, I have to assent to faith. But I cannot make faith. And the way we get faith is we ask, on your knees, on your knees in front of the tabernacle, on your knees in front of Christ, to ask, Lord, give me faith, as the apostles say, increase our faith. And by faith, again, I'm not meaning simply to believe that God exists and that he's up there somewhere. I mean to have this living relationship of love. And the way we get this is through asking, Lord, increase my faith. To ask him, to beg him, to, to, and this, is, this is, has to be the stuff of our prayers. As I say, it's not bad intercession. Don't get me wrong with what I was saying a minute ago. Intercession is not wrong. It's not wrong to pray and to ask for something. You know, you're welcome to ask God. Obviously, if, you're, if you've got a sickness or there's somebody in your family that needs something, obviously intercession is good. But it's not enough. It's not enough to simply pray for stuff. The main thing is to work on our relationship with God. And when we have this relationship with God, then everything becomes clear. It's like a, a cure for our eyes. If you can't see well, if there's things blocking your vision, that you're healed by the eye becoming clear. In the Gospel many times, Jesus speaks about having your eye uh, pure. And it's not just to do with sexual morality. It's that there has to be a pureness in our sight so that we can see God that this vision, this light of faith, allows us to see God's providence, to see his mercy, to see his action in our own lives. Again, the Old Testament, the New Testament, are full of examples of people who found God, people who are close to God. But the Christian has to be somebody who has this same experience. Abraham, who is the father of faith in the Old Testament, Our Lady, who is the image of faith in the New Testament, both have clear, a clear vision of God. And here I'm not talking about, I don't know, that you're brushing your hair in the morning and you see Saint Gabriel perched on your shoulder. If in the morning you see Saint Gabriel perched on your shoulder, I suppose there's some psychiatrist perhaps you could call. But that's not what faith is about. That revelation finished with Jesus Christ. That the, again, that the, the, the content of our faith was decided by the time of the death of the last apostle, technically. That by the time St. John, the evangelist, died, that was the, the revelation was at its fullness. Since then, the last 2,000 years, or 1,900 years, the church has been meditating on that revelation and growing in her understanding of that revelation. The revelation finishes there. The, the stuff, the matter, the object of our faith is given to us in the church. And so, I suppose, beware of all these people who try to find new stuff. That there's always an attraction of something new that there are people there, I was in Waterstones earlier this afternoon, and they have uh, all sorts of books there, and the one book that I was looking at, I mean, the religion section of Waterstones is a great place to go if you want to see what people are thinking about. But it's not a great place to go if you want to find out about Christianity. But anyway, there was a, a Gnostic Gospels on sale, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel, I don't know who the other one was, Pontius Pilate or somebody else. 
And it's like every Easter or Christmas, the National Geographic will publish a new gospel. I don't know why the National Geographic Society has decided to go on this campaign, but they're always publishing new gospels that have been found in Nag Hammandi or somewhere in Syria or somewhere. They find some papyrus somewhere and they say this is a new gospel. And, you know, I, they're not forgeries, they're 5th, 6th century texts, they're, they're, they're coming hundreds of years after the gospel, they're all at least 400 years younger than the gospels are. And they're made up the same way as you can find many fantasies made up today. But the content of our faith is what is received by us in the church. The church is the guarantor of our faith. And that we're invited to adhere to this. And this is something even without understanding. Nobody can understand everything that the church teaches. I mean, it's like St. Thomas Aquinas said once, if you find somebody who says that they've, written, that they've read all of St. Augustine, they're lying. There's so much there that you can spend your whole life studying one tiny aspect of it and not get to the end. But this part of faith is to trust, is to trust in the church. And why do we trust in the church? Basically, we trust in the church because we have had the experience of God's love and God's mercy. That it's only having seen God's goodness towards us, which is why it cannot stay up here. It can never remain just here. You can't think yourself to heaven. There has to be this experience of the goodness of God that is given to us. And then we pray. We pray, we ask God, we beg God. You know, we thank God. So often we forget about thanking God. That yes, as I said, we're very good at making our needs known to God and telling him you forgot this, do this, do that, do the other. But to say thank you. I thank you, Lord, because you have given me, I don't know, you helped me last Sunday, but the Mass I went to touched me greatly, and I thank you for this. I thank you because uh, you allow this thing to happen at work. I don't understand it, but I give you thanks for it. So this praise of God, thank you, Thankfulness and praise are as important as petition. So to have this relationship with God, whereby everything is God manifesting himself, that God is in our lives. Again, I always think of, I know it's not the best example, I never have the best examples, but anyway, uh, the example of the fiddler of the roof. I don't know if you remember that movie or the, the show if you ever saw it, but the, 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 the guy, the main man in it, is this, um, is this old Jewish guy. And what I love is that the whole of thing is a dialogue with God. I don't understand why you did this. Why did you give me five daughters? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? But he continually dialogues with the Lord and thanks the Lord. And he gets through because of that. That his journey in life is easier because he has a continual dialogue with God. And this is what the Christian, like the Jew, the Christian is called to have. A continual dialogue with the Lord. This invoking the Lord, asking the Lord, begging the Lord... To help and the Lord will enlighten the Lord will give you this certainty and to have a true faith is to have the certainty that God is good and many times in the most difficult moments in life we have this experience I don't know if you've seen this, but sometimes in the really difficult moments, the moments when you're facing a difficult sickness, when somebody close to you is dying, when there's some tragedy that's there, if you trust the Lord, he will help you. And again, it's not simply about me understanding. It's not rational. Again, it isn't against our reason, but it's not simply <clears throat> rational. It's that God is good. And to have this conviction that God is good, this is what the saints have. Again, the saints are not more intelligent than other people. Again, some saints, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine, others were very intelligent. But to be holy and to be intelligent are two very different things. And to be holy is to have this experience of God's goodness, to have the certainty of God's goodness. This is what the saints share. The other thing that the saints share is a lot of problems. If you look at that, pick any saint you want. Pick any saint that you, that, that you have a devotion to. And look at their life. And the thing you can see is that their life has a lot of problems in it. 
Being saints did not spare them from problems. If anything, it increased the problems. And yet, their holiness allows them to see the footsteps of God in front of them, before them. It allows them to see with the, with the eyes of their, of their soul, to see this light of faith, and to have their path enlightened. And this is, again, this is God's plan for you. That God's desire for you is that you see his mercy. That you see his love. That you see his footsteps beside you, in front of you, bringing you along the right path. That this life is transitory. This life passes away. You, you click your fingers and it's like 40 years have gone by. That life goes quickly. And before you know it, it's over. And to have faith is to realize that in the midst of all this, the sure point, the, the, the steady point, is the love of God that comes to us day by day. And we find this through prayer. And prayer is something that we need to do daily. This is something that we're invited to all the time. You know, this is something that, that we have to learn how to do. Again, how do you increase your faith? Increase your prayer to start with. That to have this time of prayer, again, I'm happy with the school that the kids are learning how to, how to pray properly, that they're praying also the liturgy of, hour, of the hours of the church, is something very good to, to initiate the children in prayer. But this is an initiation that will have to continue throughout their lives. You know, it's not enough. You can't hoard prayer. It's like the manna. I don't know you know the story of the manna in the Old Testament. The manna was this bread that appeared when the, uh, when the Israelites were in, on the Exodus. And they, had no, they were in the desert. They had, no, they had no place to get food. And every day, God appeared like hoarfrost, like, like a frost. The bread appeared on the ground. And they could gather it in every day. And the thing about the manna was that the manna came in daily portions. You couldn't get... Uh, somehow a warehouse supply. If anything, they said, if they took extra manna, if they took an extra helping of it, it was full of uh, worms the next day. It had, it, had, it had become rotten overnight. Because every day they needed to get it from God. Every day they needed to, to depend on him. Only on, the, only on the Friday night, which is the day before the Sabbath for the Jews, could they get a double portion. And it would keep for the Sabbath. But that was the, other than that, you couldn't save the manna. The manna came in daily portions. And our prayer has to be in daily portions as well. Again, it's very good as a young person to pray a lot. I recommend it. But that we need to continue to pray throughout our lives. You know, you can say 17 rosaries today. Lovely. If you've got the time, fantastic. But you can't then say, I prayed 17 rosaries today. Therefore, for the next 16 days, I'm covered. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. So prayer is something that needs to be daily. And I suppose I trust in the Lord that this is, this is the other aspect of faith um, that I want to kind of stress. That faith is, faith is something that is tested. That our faith, yes, is bulletproof, but it is tested. Unless you see something under stress, you don't know how good it is. You know, they have to do stress tests to see how things are. You know, if I sell you a watch and I tell you this watch is good to 100 meters under water and you never get as much as a drop of water on it, we don't know whether it's, whether it's true or not. And same thing with faith. Faith is tested in Luke 22, 32. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brethren. And Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus said, Amen, I say to you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until three times you deny that you know me. And this is the... This is the challenge that's there for us. That so often we want to think that because I trust in God, everything will be good. 
And we have this tendency. Now that we're living in a society where many people no longer practice faith, we have the big temptation to look next door and to see my neighbour doesn't darken the door of a church. He goes on Christmas Day to the quick mass. And how come his life is better? He's got a new car and I've got a 17-year-old, I don't know, banger. And uh, it's not fair. It's not good. How come his child got into medicine, UCC, and mine only got into arts? I mean, uh, how come? That's not fair. And our faith, brothers and sisters, will be tried. It will be tested. It will be, again, it will, we will be sifted. St. Peter, the first pope, the head of the apostles, his faith was tested. And this is part of the nature of, of Christianity, that our faith is tested. And sometimes we will fail. It is the height of pride to think that I will never fail, that I will never sin. You know, if you find yourself going to Mass, and when it comes to say, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault, and you're thinking, through my husband's fault, through my daughter's fault, through my mother-in-law's most grievous fault, there is something wrong. That it has to be my fault to see that I have done wrong, I have made mistakes, and my faith sometimes will fail me. And what can we do? Very simple to get by the grace of Christ to stand up again. That this is very simply what we're called to do. That we are called to trust the Lord. And he will help us in the most difficult of situations. Again, I think, am I, how am I for time? I'm coming towards the end, I think. Uh, I'm beyond the end, he's looking at me. But anyway, um, if, um, to finish, just another story of St. Peter. But we hear this at the beginning of Peter's ministry, that he, that, he falls and he denies Christ three times. But they tell the story um, of, the, um, of Peter at the end of his life. And you can see that Quo Vadis Church in Rome, there's the old uh, book and the old movie, even Quo Vadis. But it's this uh, idea that Peter, this, this tradition, it's not in the Bible, but it's an early Christian tradition, that at the end of his life, Peter is in Rome. He's now an old, old man. He's found the church in Rome. In a sense, he's the, the head of this church. It's kind of not too bad. And now with Nero, there's a big persecution afoot. And they're beginning to kill the Christians. And Peter realizes, I'm next. They're going to come for me soon. And so one night, Peter decides, I'm going to escape. So he's there, he gets his couple of possessions together, he puts the, the bundle on his, on his back, and he heads out of Rome to escape. And as he's escaping Rome, he sees Jesus coming into Rome. So Jesus, who's died and resurrected and ascended into heaven, he sees Christ coming into Rome. And he says to him, Po Vadis Domine, where are you going, Lord? And the Lord says to him, I'm going into Rome to be crucified again because you wouldn't do it. And then Peter comes to his senses, repents, turns around, and goes back into Rome, where they crucify him, they arrest him the next day, and they sentence him to be crucified. And when the moment comes for him to be crucified, he says, I'm not worthy of this. Can you crucify me upside down? Because I'm not worthy to be crucified in the same way as Jesus. So this is, if you lose faith, don't worry. Repent. Come back to the Lord. A good confession, a good repentance, and God, who is merciful, will always receive us. So I think more or less this is uh, enough for, for one session. Um, I suppose we've got a time maybe for some questions if people have them.